Hey, happy Veterans Day 2024. It's mid-November. My this is Evan, and I'm holding one of my two holdback children's pythons. Um, and guys, this time of year is real fun because I've kind of I've moved through all my children's pythons from the last year, and the only thing I have left are my clut and my two holdbacks. And I'm kind of moving into the uh, looking towards the fall breeding season, and so we're kind of starting the next season. So this is a real fun way to move up those things that are still left over. And guys, I'll tell you, I like snakes in general, and to me, this is a really amazing pet snake. Children's pythons just are one of those snakes that are they're active and interesting and inquisitive, and they have a lot of personality. Um, they're hardy, so you don't have to worry about them. They're small, so they're easy. They're just a really great animal. I'm just pretty high on these this species. Um, for anybody, they, they have a lot to offer for me as somebody who's kind of an intermediate keeper, but they really are great, even beginner snakes too. So um, that's just one thing I tell you guys is these guys are amazing. I'm happy with how this project is going. When I got into this project four or five years ago, I wanted to bring a really good, interesting, a little less common species to the New England area and get him out to keep his hands and I've been able to do that a lot the last couple of years so that's been really fun for me so thank you guys everybody uh, and also I just personally enjoy these guys quite a lot so um, what I wanted to do today is show you guys a way that I would set these guys up if I just had one or two um, and it was gonna be a pet or a companion animal and so um, I'll just tell you like kind of my end goal and I've been thinking about this for a while is to think about like a ready-made starter kit that was actually a good starter kit for these animals and my goal is I'd like to be able to offer have for sale I only vend a couple of expos a year but I like to have for sale on the table next to the snakes I'd like to have a ready-to-go starter kit that people could um, purchase and leave so they have everything they needed and my kind of target price point I'm looking for a price point of about 75 to 100 bucks and what I want to give you guys for that is to get a nice acrylic case like this. I want to get you guys a heat source with a way to control it. I want to get you guys a couple of different types of bedding, a couple of small little accessories, and I want to send you guys home with um, an IR temp. And so maybe what I'll do is have these. My goal is to try to get this for 75 bucks and send you home with everything for 100 bucks or something like that. And I could even ship those if I wanted. The shipping would be extra. Um, but I was thinking that I could even do that so I could ship in advance to some of my male customers or anybody that really wanted one um, one of these setups a week or two before I ship the animal and then you get it up and running and then I ship it to you. So I'm hoping to create a really good plug and play little like systems for people to get real nice little companion animals because um, I've been talking to a lot of people about these and how to set them up and they're really hardy animals. There's not a lot that you have to worry about them with. Um, but the challenge with them, the thing that I've been telling people is that when they're babies, they are so small. They are smaller than a night crawler. Um, this is about a five or six month old baby right now. And it's like at least two or three times as big as it was when it was born. And so part and parcel to that, the hardest part about keeping these snakes when they're babies is finding something that's secure enough for them. So me personally, like you can't keep them in a normal hatching rack. So like a lidless hatching rack, like you keep boas or fall pythons, they can get out of those. Um, you can't keep them in most cages. They can get out of those. You, um, um, even adults, just so you know, even adults can get out of the gap in a slider in a vision cage. I actually almost learned that the hard way. I almost lost an adult breeder bulk, uh, children's python. Uh, in between the gap in a sliding vision cage. So just so you know, they can get out of a lot of things. And so uh, cage security is super important for these guys. So what I came up with um, is I've been recommending people use large food containers. I say use something with a surface area about the size of a sheet of paper and then melt tiny little holes in it because food containers are air and water tight, so they're eminently secure that you can control tiny little air holes in them. But that's really kind of lacking in um, attractiveness. And I think a lot of people want something a little bit more and I'd want something a little bit more. Uh, and so I found these little acrylic cases and I think that's kind of gonna be the foundation of what I set these guys up as. These acrylic cases um, are 12 inches by eight inches by six inches tall. They're actually meant for invertebrates. They're like tarantula boxes. They have these sliding tops um, that are magnetically held to make sure I don't pinch the snake. And they look pretty good. So I think this might be the solution um, to what I was looking for. And so just so you guys kind of know, I'm going to show you guys how I set this up. I'm going to make a second one. Uh, that little snake is just going back and finding a little micro environment. But if you see in here, uh, it's wicked simple. I have a water bowl and I always uh, melt a hole in the lid. 
uh, and that's how I offer water. It just controls splashing and humidity. I have another exactly the same type of bowl, but this one's full of damp moss, so that's a wet, humid hide. And then I have uh, Teclan. It's a shredded aspen bedding across the majority of it. I have a little bit more of a wad of moss right there. And then I have some sticks from the garden. So um, that's how I have this accessorized. And the way I'm heating it is I'm holding it inside of a very large rack just because that's what I have. So um, let me show you what I've got going on. Let me just put this back. So this is how I've got it set up. I've had this one set up for a couple of days now. And then this one is just dry cycling. So I'm gonna show you exactly how I set this up, but let me show you what my temperature parameters are. And so what I've been telling people is when you set up your cage, you wanna set it up so that you get a, there's a hot mat over a quarter of the cage that is between 88 and 92. And then you want your front to be ambient temperatures. So that's 81. So there's, it goes from 81 to 91 on that. And this is at the high, warmest part of the day. It's actually pretty warm in here today. It's like 78 degrees in my snake room. But that's kind of the temperature range. You can go a little bit cooler than that, but that's how I'm heating them. And let's go ahead and let's show how you might do that at home, okay? And so... If you had a rack system that was big enough that you could slip this into, there's no reason you couldn't do that. You could probably even just put it on top of the warm spot on top of a cage, uh, at about a third of the bottom of it, and that would do well. But what most of you guys are going to want to do is use some sort of heat mat. So these are gen they're just inexpensive heat mats. Um, don't use this one's a stick on one, but don't stick it onto the bottom. What you want to do is you want to take either a thermostat probe, tape it to your heat mat and then put it on top of your container, so or your cage, so that it covers about a third of the bottom to a quarter to a third of the bottom. Or the other thing you could do is you could use a rheostatic dimmer, that's like a lamp dimmer, and you could control it and dial it in with your, um, with your IR gun. And so basically, this is what you have to think if you're using a dimmer switch, is you have to say that um, wherever the dimmer is set, it raises, it, you take the temperature on the heat mat and then take the temperature on the ambient surface next to it. The difference is how much is that heat mat is raising it over ambient temperature. So if you know this is 72 and you have something at 87, 88, it's raising it 15 degrees. Um, and so that's fine, but you also have to be a little bit careful to get so that you don't get away from yourself. And so what I would do is I would say, figure out how much the heat mat is raising the temperature over air temperature, and think about what the hottest temperature in that room you might get is, and dial that temperature back so that the um, hottest temperature in the room plus the raise, how much the heat mat raises the temperature is no hotter than like 92, 93. So for example, if your room is as hot as at 74, is hottest at 75 and you know that it's, you're going to want to dial it back in so that you're going to hit 93 and you'll know that if you're ever cooler than 75 you're going to be somewhere below that temperature you're controlling the high and hot temperature rather than the low and hot temperature and you're also going to have to watch that seasonally too if you use a lamp dimmer but the other thing i will tell you is that this species is pretty good at handling a wide range of temperatures and these cages are pretty good about ventilating so you're not going to have as many concerns with that type of stuff as you would if you had a really tight container and a more, um, like a less tolerant species. So that's just what I'll tell you about setting your temperatures. Uh, but you could go ahead and invest in a thermostat for $35 as well. But let's talk about the container from there, all right? And the container, if you got this from, your, you, if you're buying something yourself, you probably want to find something similar to this. This is an arachnid container. This one is by, uh, is by Reptazoo, that's the company, and they say this is an acrylic. Crystal acrylic cases, ACR01B, I believe that is what the model number is. It's a 300 by 200 by 150 millimeter case. So um, that's what this is. Um, if you're looking about where to order them, you can order them at Reptile Deli. Um, Reptile Deli is a um, 
They are a dry goods vendor that vends a lot of the expos in New England, and they're just good guys. I don't, I bought these full price. I didn't get anything special from them, but you can buy this case from Reptile Deli. Um, I think it's forty dollars online. I got a little cheaper at the expos, but that's what I have for you, and that's what I would tell you. And the only thing I don't love about this case is, I'll just show you. It's actually a really beautiful, well-designed case, but they have this stupid little cup holder back here, and. I'll just tell you, I'm not a huge fan of cup holders in my cages in general because I think they're a limitation. But the other thing I'll tell you is if you're going to put a cup holder in the damn cage, put it at the front of the cage because heat's always on the back. If you put your water over the heat, you create tons of condensation. So I wish this wasn't here at all, but if it was here, it should be right up there. Um, so it's just kind of, I don't know. That's the only thing I don't like about this cage. But the other thing I will tell you is I tried to remove it on the last one, but I think acrylics like PVC and that they like chemically bonded. I'm pretty sure I'd destroy the cage if I tried. So we're just going to deal with it. And I'll show you how I'm kind of going about this. So let's see my tripod. Here we go. So I have water container. Moss container. I'm actually going to go get this nick and put it into it because I'm going to reuse the damp moss. Let me just show you how I set these guys up when they are, when I have a group of them. And these guys are ready for an upgrade. So that's about it. Oops, sorry. Sorry, snake. But, um, this is actually one of the bigger ones I have, but, um, they're ready to get upsized. But when I have them as a group, I just keep them on a little bit of sphagnum moss and the water bowl. And the one thing you have to be, see, good feeders. Um, but the one thing you have to be careful of with them is to control the dampness on that sphagnum moss. I like sphagnum moss in these small containers because it absorbs moisture, it mediates moisture, um, but I don't wet it. That's one thing I tell people to be careful. These are not wet animals. They don't appreciate being wet, but that's just how I keep them. But we're going from here, we're up caging them into this. It's something about twice as big. It's gonna be a little more complex. And so now that they're fully established, now that I have fewer of them, um, I will tell you that that extra enhanced cage is a good thing. But when you're starting to get them, trying to get them started feeding, it's good to have just something real basic so you don't have to move things around and startle them before you try feeding them. But here we go. So that's just kind of what I have. The first thing I'm gonna do, I'm going to use this because they, he is a hungry bugger, is I'm gonna take some of this moss. This is fresh moss, I replaced it last week. And put it into that little cup just to fill that hole and also create another micro environment. Watch me get food wrapped right here by this little spunky one because that's what he wants to do. But, and then the other thing I'm gonna do is, ooh, I just tried to bite you. Little bugger. So guys, this is how you tend to the need basically and simply. Humid high box. This is all your snake will ever need is an appropriate size little humid high box to mediate, uh, mediate the moisture. Beyond that, I'm using something called Teclan Bedding. Teclan Bedding is my favorite Aspen product. It's kind of hard to get, but it's a shredded consistency. So it's not shavings and it's not sandy chips. I hate sandy chips. They're just messy. There's nothing wrong with them. I just... They're messy. Uh, but what I like about these is they're not as messy. Uh, and they kind of pack down and mat down. Uh, and you can actually, over time, you'll see the animal create little like race tracks and things in it. So it's kind of nice that way. But go ahead and give them a nice little layer. Pack it in so to hold your accessories in place. Um, little topography is never... Never a bad thing. But yeah, type on the nice one. It's hard to find. You can get it anywhere you can buy. Usually people that sell sandy chips will also sell Teclan, but it's just less common. It's my favorite. Uh, and then add a water container right here. And then some climbing structure. So put this in right like that. Like this. These are just safe hardwoods from my property, so I know they haven't been sprayed or anything. You could use grapevine or something else. But that's about that. And then beyond that, um, 
You just make sure you have the proper heat covering about a third of the bottom of the cage, uh, somewhere between 88 and 92, and it's time to add the animals. So, one of my two hold backs. And then when you want to go secure it, all I have, whoop. Oh, do you see the cell food reactor right now? And then it latches back in there. So that's what this is like, guys. And this is rehoused, and this will deal with it. Uh, be good for it until it's ready to go in a full-size cage. So this is gonna be good for another six, eight months at least. And um, guys, comment if you think that that's actually a good idea. If you th like, would like me to create little uh, to go kits that you can either buy at an expo or get mailed to you for an additional cost Let me know if that's something you could idea because it would take some effort, but I actually want to do it So um, I just probably need some encouragement, but there you go This is how I'd be setting them up and then I'd be putting them in, and I'm gonna be putting them in the heat rack um, Or you could put them on a little heat mat. So there you go. Hope that's of help to you. Bye-bye